So who here has eaten acorns? Sweet, awesome, okay. So I guess uh, I like to start out any acorn talk by saying I am not capable in the next hour or two of actually teaching you how to eat acorns every day. Um, it's taken me seven, uh, no, I guess nine years to get to that point. Um, there's just, there's so many steps of it that have their own individual learning curve. It's also just, uh, you know, what I found, what I found out many times over is that I didn't grow up having any relationship to my staple foods. And so even being able to conceptualize what the bulk of my calories looks like in raw form for a year, it, like that is issue number one. So what I'm trying to get at is that I would like to, you know, so we're gonna bake acorn crust pizzas in a little while and eat those. Uh, and then I'm gonna try to give you as many sort of tips and sort of grease the rails for you as much as I can just to get you you know, over some of the humps that I had a lot of issues with. Um, but yeah, just to, you know, so I would highly encourage any questions at any point that, you know, the best I can do is sort of fill in the blanks in your mind about what the mysteries are. Um, yeah, okay. So the first thing to know in trying to eat acorns is that we're actually talking about two uh, pretty different foods. So oak trees, most oak trees can be divided into a white oak group and a red oak group. White oaks have rounded lobes like a white cloud. Uh, red oaks have pointed lobes like a red fire, okay? So that's, you know, if you're out sort of scouting trees or you've got oak trees that you live by or walk by regularly, that's sort of easiest way to know the difference between them year or, you know, through most of the year. Um, but really, you don't, like I have harvested hundreds of pounds of acorns from trees that I never even looked up to see their leaves. You can tell just from the nuts what kind of oak you're dealing with. So the bag of nuts that are a little more, uh, so that are more elongated, and when you pull them out, you can push on them and see that they've got like a more flexible shell. Those are white oaks. The red oaks tend to be more rounded. They've got almost like a luster to their shell, and you cannot, they have no give at all in their shell. It's very much more like a true nut shell. Okay. So if you have never processed acorns and you are just sort of excited about learning how to do it, I would recommend seeking out white oak acorns. Um, they're lower tannin and so the likelihood you will get them fully leached out and palatable is higher than with red oaks. Um, they also have a somewhat more distinct flavor, and so you're likely to get a little bit more excited once you finally taste your food that you made. They also, per tree, tend to produce very much more than red oaks. Um, you know, if you've ever been under an oak tree and seen just a carpet of marbles where you cannot walk because there's so many nuts, it's likely that was a white oak. So does that, you know, you guys can see the nuts when they come around, but does that differentiation sort of make sense? There are a couple species of red oak in our area, northern red oak and black oak. Um, and then there's a couple common species of white oak in our area, eastern white oak and chestnut oak. Chestnut oak leaves look quite a bit different than this, and the nuts are very large. They're also the most tannic acorn. So if you happen to find an oak tree that has shockingly large acorns, personally, I would re recommend passing those over. I've never been able to get them to leach to where I thought they were good food. Is that chestnut, you said? Chestnut oak, yeah. What do you think of the dwarf chestnut oak? Uh, I've never processed them, yeah. Okay, so then you're going to pick up a whole bunch of acorns. So 
The way that I started out doing this and what I recommend you starting out doing is getting down on your knees and picking up one acorn at a time. Uh, it's nice to have like an open container that you can easily just toss into. It's really nice to have energetic children that will spend possibly 10 minutes helping you. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it sounds like that's just gonna take forever. And it does take time. The, the advantage of picking up one nut at a time versus any sort of mass collection is that you're performing a quality control step in one step. Like you're picking up nuts. If it does not look like it's got an edible kernel inside, you're not putting it in your basket. If you mass gather a bunch of nuts, you're gonna have to do that same step further down the line. So if you wind up getting really excited about this, I highly recommend this tool, it's called a nut wizard. So it comes with like a long broom handle type thing and you just roll it along the ground and the nuts, yeah, you can put those down. And so the nuts just pop into the wire and then it comes with this wire that you stick on a box or a bucket and you slide it in and it opens up and they all just dump out into your bucket. So I estimate that anywhere between six and 10 times the gathering speed with this versus by hand. Um, but again, the downside is that you're gonna be doing quality control further down the line. So in my opinion, there's sort of a breaking point where if you're first getting into this and you're wanting to just like, you know, make a couple pounds of acorn flour in the fall, just like a really awesome seasonal thing, no reason to spend money on that. If you're wanting to actually store up any significant amount of acorns, definitely a worthwhile investment. These things are only, I think they're about 40 bucks, something like that, yeah. How rough of a uh, soil area can you run that over? If it's Pretty rough, I mean, you know, if it's like a forest floor with branches and all kinds of stuff, obviously it gets more difficult. If it's a grass, you know, like in the picture, if it's a grassy area, it's realistic. Uh, honestly, by far, most of the acorns that I gather at this point are out of school and church parking lots. Because, you know, as majestic as it sounds to go out in the wild forest and pick up nuts off, off the ground, it's just not an efficient way to gather food. The people that lived off of this stuff, like those folks in California, were managing that understory every year. So it was like that ecosystem was managed over thousands of years to be conducive to that activity. That's, I've found school parking lots where they're graded and paved in a way that everything drains down into the gutter. And so literally I can find 50 pounds of acorns and gather them up in 20 minutes. Um, so yeah, go around to uh, like neighborhoods are great. That picture I showed before of Riverside Cemetery, perfect. Um, there's a ton of food in that place, so go get it. The other thing to talk about there is, I, so I've been saying you're gonna perform a quality control step when you're picking up the acorns. So what does that look like? Um, so the main uh, pest issue with acorns is weevils, oak weevils. So it's this small little bug that lays its eggs in the nut and they overwinter in the, so that its larval stage all happens inside the nut, it eats out all the kernel, it then digs a hole through the shell and crawls out into the soil. So if you're picking up nuts and you see a hole, it's very likely that there's either no or very little kernel left in that nut. And so what I do is just throw that as far away as I can, because I don't want to pick it up five more times. Um, the, so that's fine and easy. The, where it gets more complicated is that if the larva is still living inside the shell, there is no hole. So how do you tell then if you're picking up one that is just gonna tunnel out in your house and then be crawling all over your floor? 
So the answer is that you want to look at the, uh, I can never quite remember this word, abscission, I believe, of where the cap was connected to the nut. Um, if there's discoloration around that circle, what that means is that that injection of the egg disrupted the fiber coming from the tree and it died back into the tree. And so you can see that on that circle. If you pick up a nut and it looks vibrantly white and like it's, it's full of life, that's food. If you pick it up and it looks like a little bit off colored and just not very vibrant, that's not food. So I'm gonna bring around these ones that are, so one of these is what I would assume is a totally good nut. One of these is what I would say is a quite obviously bad nut. And the third is what I would say is a less obviously bad nut. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's the good one and the bad one and the less obviously bad one. So again, like with all stages of this, there's a certain point. So obviously, if you're using this thing, you're picking up all kinds of stuff. Um, the, so the issue then is that you're just gonna have to deal with more waste in the end when you're actually making food, or you're going to dry so fast and efficiently that the undeveloped larvae get roasted in the shell and you eat them. So that's the other thing to note about these larvae, they are 100% edible. You know, we have this cultural aversion to eating insects, but all humans eat insects. Some of them just pretend that they don't. So let's get over that. Um, there's actually a, there's a wild food teacher guy in town that specifically harvests acorns and puts them over a screen in his fridge to catch the larva. And he then markets them to like high-end chefs. So they're also quite tasty. So we, so the way, the main, so because I'm mass harvesting acorns, the way I deal with those larvae, rather than checking each nut as I pick it up, is I just dry them as fast as I can. So what we used to do is lay out racks like this, and depending on the weather uh, and temperature, I would either just put those in a sunny window, use some sort of, you know, if I could put that as close as possible to a wood stove, that's awesome. If I have to, but I don't like to, I would use like a space heater and a fan type of situation. Basically some combination of heat and airflow is how you efficiently dry things out. Um, you know, an issue that I had to try to figure out in learning this stuff is that there's a point where the, em so while the embryo inside the nut is alive, uh, it's, it's fairly resistant to molds and funguses. Once that embryo dies, it's not at all resistant. You know, all of those antimicrobial properties break down, and so all sorts of aflatoxin-producing molds can grow on that. You don't want to eat that. Um, so you definitely don't want the nuts to be drying out a little bit and then rehydrating a little bit and then drying back out a little bit and then rehydrating a little bit that will produce all kinds of molds. It also produces this weird, I call it slow fermentation, that tastes gross. It's not a desirable fermentation at all. Um, so the most important thing to achieve that is to lay the nuts out, like you see here, in a single pile. If they're piled up at all, all of that contact is gonna hold moisture in. The second, thing you can do to, you know, assure that process is airflow. And then the third thing would be gentle heat. Uh, you know, when we got up to a point where we wanted to start trying to sell flour and cookies and all this stuff, I connected with a friend who runs a sawmill and has solar lumber kilns. 
And so he lets us dry acorns on the top of his lumber stacks in his solar lumber kiln. So this is like plastic glazing up here. He's got these solar powered vent fans in there. Um, this is, so honestly, the, it gets up to about 140 degrees in these kilns. That's a little bit higher than I would ideally like. But again, like with all of these things, if you're trying to harvest a thousand pounds of acorns, you gotta make a little bit of a compromise with that. Um, so yeah, the, the issue with hitting that high temperature is that you're causing oxidation. So you're losing all of those fats that we're trying to get and you're losing vitamins. Um, yeah. Okay, does that make sense? Drying, yeah. What would you say is the ideal temperature that you would want? Um, so the temperature, so uh, chestnut growers that deal with those larvae on a very large scale, what they do is they submerge the chestnuts in a hot water bath at 121 degrees for 12 minutes. So if you can get the air temperature of where you're drying your nuts to 125, it's very likely you're gonna kill larva. Or what I've seen is that they will just dig out early and just try to get away from there. So they won't, they won't continue to damage that kernel. I would say anything below about 160 is okay. Um, yeah. So heat and time, though, is what is producing oxidation. So if it's gonna be at a higher temperature, ideally less time. In this solar lumber kiln, these get adequately dry for storage anywhere, you know, if we've got dry weather, 24 hours and they're done. In a passive setup like those racks, it takes three weeks. Even in wet weather in these kilns, I've had it take a week, but that was when I loaded like about 500 pounds into one kiln at one time. Yeah, so again, this is one of those learning curve things. The way that I determine that they are dry and ready for storage is that you can crack them open and I, if you can't dig a fingernail into the kernel, it's dry enough to store. If, so again, like I've been saying, if you're just trying to do this as like a seasonal thing or you're just sort of learning how to do this, I would just try to, so w the reason that you wanna dry them on any scale is that the kernel will shrivel away from the shell and so rather than having to peel the shell off, you can crack them and the kernel will just fall free. You can reach that point even in a passive setup in about five to seven days, something like that. Does that make sense? Oh, you, you kind of just answered it. I okay. Was, to clarify, they will store basically indefinitely undried, but you don't want the larva to persist, so you dry them to kill the larva and for ease of processing. Okay, very good point. Okay, no, 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 not at all. That's definitely something to clarify. So white oaks, so like we've been saying, there's white oaks and there's red oaks. So white oaks, when they drop in the fall, are trying to sprout as soon as they can, grow a root into the ground, and then it, sometimes they'll actually put up a little shoot in the fall, and then they actually start growing the following year. Red oaks drop to the ground and do not sprout at all until the following April or May. So what that means for this, to answer your question, is that white oaks want to either sprout or they're gonna die. So I think there's about a three to four week window where you want them to be dried out. If you, this is something I've seen a lot, when I used to like open up all of my equipment to people to just like bring acorns to and process. Most of the stuff people would bring me, they had like harvested into a shopping bag and left in the trunk of their car, which is like the absolute worst thing you could do to them because the heat and the humidity makes them want to sprout. The sprouts don't have any soil to go into, so they die and then it all starts molding. Um, so yeah, once you harvest them, 
uh, with white oaks, you want to get them laid out and drying as quickly as you possibly can. That's a great clarification. So this is part of the reason that I, you know, when I was starting out and sort of hearing what other people were teaching about acorns and the sort of general consensus among, you know, the experts is that you want to gather white oaks because they're lower tannin and that's the limiting factor. What I realized in sort of broadening my scope of learning about this stuff and then actually experimenting with it is that red oaks are much higher fat, which I want. They're also, because they're higher fat and because of their physiology and not wanting to sprout until the spring, they are massively easier to dry and store. You have a almost six month window between when you pick them up off the ground and when they want to sprout. So I, so like to sort of test and experiment with this, I've harvested red oaks into a paper, an old paper feed sack and left them through the winter and spring. And I opened it up in the spring and there had definitely been more larva, weevil larva damage than there would be if I laid them out and dried them well. But the ones that weren't weevil damaged were 100% fine. They had dried in the bag and were totally fine. So again, when you're just starting out and sort of on a small scale, white oaks, all of the issues with white oaks are manageable. It's not that big a deal on a small scale. If you've got like a window screen full of nuts you're trying to dry, not a problem. If you're trying to dry a thousand pounds of nuts, you are either going to need to construct or find some sort of drying facility. Whereas with red oaks, I don't use these kilns for red oaks because the fat is so valuable to me and it's just not required. So I still use screens like those for red oaks and totally fine. I harvested last year, I think about 500 pounds of red oaks, dried them all on screens like that, totally fine. Where do you place those screens for the red oaks? Um, wherever I can make space in my three children house. <laughs> Ideally, I keep trying to sort of set it up to build a rack system that goes above our wood stove. That would be like the ideal to me because that dry, heated convection action would be great. Uh, but inevitably that never happens and so they're usually just sort of stacked somewhere in that vicinity. Um, yeah. It really is, so if you're trying to scale, really if you're trying to scale up any of this stuff, rodent proofing becomes a major issue. Um, you know, that's, I've dried red oaks in a sort of outbuilding at our place that's got a nice huge glass window on it, but once mice find their way in, it's done. Um, they will go through a lot of acorns. In the fall, they're trying to get as fat as they possibly can. Um, so, yeah. Okay, questions on drying, yeah? Um, well, on the red oak acorns, while you're waiting to process them, can you store them in a quite cold area, like a... You could, yeah, you could put them like in a fridge or something, would be fine. That's the same way you would treat like fresh chestnuts. The issue though is that that's gonna do nothing at all to the weevils. Like you, I've seen, I've heard people say like, oh, I usually just put them in the freezer to kill the weevils. That doesn't kill the weevils. Um, th Cause they, I mean, they overwinter in the upper layer of the topsoil. They're totally fine in that environment. Um, the issue with, so w with a freezer, especially the issue is that that cold will kill the embryo. And so then you're in that time crunch of having to get it dried out or it's fermenting and breaking down and all that stuff. So in a fridge would be okay, but I would wanna be getting them dry as soon as I possibly could. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? This really, so this is, you know, the, a lot of times when I'm teaching this stuff, what I say is get them off the ground, get them dry, and then contact me and we'll figure it out. So what I mean by that is this is the time sensitive step. You could like I've got white oak, the white oaks that we're gonna eat today were harvested in 2017. They're totally fine. If you can get them dried out 
and stored in the shell, they will last a very long time. The tannin seems to be a preservative, essentially.